Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as Clement said, this is the uh, third lecture from a series of four. And maybe I can briefly uh, remind you how we started. It was a first lecture on general introduction to what is macromolecular engineering and how one can control polymer structures in a specific way. And the second lecture was mostly on how these systems work, how atom transfer radical polymerization, but some other uh, control radical polymerization work. And also we discussed how one can control these processes by some external stimuli. So this included electrical current, also mechanical forces, pressure, light, and some other stimuli as well. And today we'll be talking about uh, how one can employ this chemistry in order to prepare polymers with quite sophisticated architecture. And I will give you some examples of the block copolymers, also gradient, and a little bit about molecular brushes, some non-linear uh, structures. And the last lecture in a week, uh, in fact, it will be on Thursday, not on Wednesday, will be mostly focused on the hybrid materials, which means organic, inorganic, uh, structures, but also bioconjugates and some polymers relevant to energy and the environment, essentially. So uh, we'll be talking really how to synthesize polymers with sometimes very dense grafting, sometimes with a, a branching structure, sometimes colloidal structures, and also precisely controlled uh, networks. So there are general uh, three different components of the molecular architecture in polymers, and this would include controlling composition of polymer chains, meaning that if we have uh, two components, they can be somehow statistically incorporated along the chain land. It may be abrupt change, so this would be segmented copolymers or block copolymers. Another special example would be graft copolymers, which we'll discuss, in fact, with few examples today. There are also periodic polymers, the simplest alternating, but sometimes you can have a certain control periodicity or controlled sequence, and eventually gradient copolymers when you change composition continuously from one chain end to the other chain end. Elements of topology would include some kind of a branching. It can be one focal point, like in star polymers. It may be something resembling more complex structures. And we'll discuss about networks, and in fact networks which would be also functional networks. So we coined the name for them STEM networks, and I will explain you at the end how they work. So using radical polymerization, we have one advantage that we can incorporate many functionalities, and these functionalities can include something which cannot be applied to anionic or cationic polymerization, sometimes hydroxy groups, sometimes amino groups, carboxylic acids, uh, some more sophisticated structures as well. And eventually we can combine these three components into even more complex structures, something like the multifunctional mictoarm brushes, or gradient brushes, or pom-pom-like uh, structures, or some others as well. So let me start really with how you can incorporate uh, graft copolymers, or sometimes even so-called bottle brushes. There are three techniques in order to get this uh, quite sophisticated structure. On one side, we can graft from. We have a backbone, which has initiating sites along the backbone, and then we add monomer units one by one. This allows you to have high grafting density. Sometimes you may use very long backbone of degrees of polymerization, thousands, essentially, or macro initiator alone has a million molecular weight. But sometimes, if you have this so gra high graft density, not all initiating sites may be initiated. So, uh, usually you can get maybe 90% initiation efficiency, sometimes under special conditions, 95 or so. Another approach is grafting onto. In that case, we have a functional <coughs> structure, and then there is a complementary short side chains which can combine with them together. So you need, in that case, very highly efficient reactions. Sometimes it could be like a click reaction. So classical example would be azide and alkyne structure. However, because of the steric effects and repulsions, grafting densities are rarely approaching these 80 or 50%, sometimes even much lower. Because of a steric repulsion, 
the next polymer chain would have a hard time to be incorporated. There is a third route, which is called grafting through. In that case, one uses macromonomers, polymerizable structure. The radical process will be double bonds, but you can use also potentially cyclics like uh, metathesis polymerization, but also could be anionic or cationic polymerization. And then you can prepare these polymacromonomers in one step. It depends really what is the distance between these side chains. For vinyl monomers, as you will see today, sometimes it's a challenge. Because if every second carbon atom, you have a thick chain, this distance, every second carbon atom, is only quarter nanometer. If you have a ring opening polymerization, it may be one nanometer if it would be five monomer units or five carbon atoms in a ring, or sometimes even larger things. However, not necessarily you must homopolymerize these macromonomers. You can sometimes copolymerize them. You may have a two different structures, or sometimes you may also dilute this graph density by copolymerization with some monomers. And in that case, you can have structures which would be homogeneous, heterogeneous. They can be heterogeneous, like a really tail and the brush, as you will see in some examples later, or making even block copolymers which can face separate in a special way. So we start with one example which really will show you how different sometimes properties polymers may have even if they have exactly the same composition. If I will have a 50% of white and 50% of black, I can incorporate them with a different regularity or different architecture. So one example, like shown here, it would be resembling a comb, comb which we used to brush our hair. But another one would be more like a toothbrush. So it will be like a nano toothbrush, which you can brush, maybe not necessarily your teeth, but at least it would resemble that. Or you could say that this would be like a palm tree. You have a trunk and then you have this side chain somehow uh, going uh, together. So I will show you one example for the copolymerization of macromonomers with different monomers. We take metacrylate monomer which in the simplest case is metal metacrylate. So this is really, uh, you can make plexiglass this way. And the other one contains a polydimethyl siloxane side chain. Polydimethyl siloxane has molecular weight macromonomer approximately 2000. This has only 100. So if I do them at the uh, really uh, concentration by weight 50-50, it means I will have a 20 times more this monomer than this monomer. But regardless, it looks like they should have a similar reactivity. This is metacrylate, this is metacrylate. However, in fact, they are very different also. This polydimethyl siloxane does not dissolve, dissolve in methyl metacrylate. Methyl metacrylate is too polar. So you need to add some co-solvent. Typically, at least 3% of xylene to make it homogeneous. But in reality, if you want to make a free radical polymerization, in that case, we would follow this with a 30% of xylene. If you measure reactivity ratio, reactivity ratio means how many times faster methyl metacrylate radical will react with its own rather than with PDMS. You would expect one to one because they are of the same chemical structure. However, reactivity ratio of methyl metacrylate is three times higher in that case. So these radicals will react with MMA three times faster than with PDMS macromonomer. It's a free radical process, it's a slow initiation. So what will happen, you will be essentially first consuming this orange MMA much faster and less this blue PDMS. And progressively, you will have more and more PDMS left. So you can up end up nearly like with a homo PDMS at the end. In fact, it's a kind of a messy system because you have a very different composition. This is very rich in PDMS. This is very rich in PMMA. So what can we do a little bit better? Can we start polymerization, which will be controlled or living process? And under these conditions, we are using atom transfer radical polymerization. So all chains start growing at the same time. But if you use this only very small amount of xylene, it looks like methyl metacrylate <coughs> is still two times more reactive than this PDMS macromonomer. So what happens in this case is, first, that you have a fast initiation. All chains start growing at the same time. But still, this orange MMA incorporates faster 
than this blue PDMS micromonomer. So what you see here is really a gradient copolymer. Every chain is ideally the same. However, every chain has a one end richer in methyl methacrylate, the other one in PDMS. So it's a classical example of a gradient structure, and you could sometimes visualize these gradients under some conditions using, in that case, atomic force microscopy, and you could see this head and tail, head and tail, head and tail, head and tail. So it's a really, you break symmetry of this molecule. Every molecule has one chain end richer in one component and poorer in the other component. So can we really reach the nearly equal reactivity ratios? In fact, the problem in these previous examples is that because you have by molar ratio 50 times more methyl metacrylate, initiator reacts with MMA and they are somehow becoming incompatible. So can we incorporate PDMS at the beginning? How we can do that? In that case, we can use macro initiators. So every chain starts with PDMS and therefore it, in some sense it compatibilizes it. So then it has an equal chance to react with MMA and PDMS. And reactivity ratios here in this semi-bulk, so this is only 3% of solvent, they are practically the same, which means that now you have a symmetrical structure and there is no gradient, no massive structure like in a free radical polymerization. So of course a question is how different properties they will have. So here what you could see is really example of some of these different uh, polymers. We selected in one case this free radical polymerization and you could see this uh, broad spectrum of different structures. Then for this gradient, in fact, we use mostly raft process, which I explained you last time, because it gave even stronger gradient in that case. So you could see this gradient structure. And eventually we use atom transfer radical process with macro initiator to get most equal distribution of grafts along polymer chains. So we wanted to have them, all of them similar. In that case, they contain 50, 50 by weight of the PDMS and polymethyl metacrylate. They have roughly speaking the same molecular weight, around 100,000. And of course, they will have a different molecular weight distribution. So how you can compare these three samples? And the simplest case is really stress-strain behavior. You prepare a specimen or a film of these polymeric materials, and then you stretch them. And first you see what is a stiffness. So this would be a slope of this plot. And the other one, what are tensile properties? How much you can extend it before they break? And what you see here, this is essentially all of them, these three polymers, this gradient prepared by raft, this messy sample prepared by free radical process, and this regular green by ATRP, they have the same stiffness. However, this gradient polymer breaks at elongation 30%. This messy sample can be extended 115%, and this regular one 300 nearly percent, or 280%. So I honestly behave at the beginning that maybe gradient would be you know, special because it has such unusual and novel structure. However, it fails really first. So why is it so? In order to understand it a little bit better, we try to make, in that case, uh, dynamic mechanical studies, which means you look at this modulus of stiffness as a function of frequency or as a function of temperature. So all of these polymers, if they are below minus 120 degrees, they are glassy. So they have a modulus in a range of 10 to power 9 Pascal. So this is like any kind of a hard plastic because even PDMS becomes hard plastic. If you cross this temperature, then they become rubbery, so modulus drops. And then what you see here is a glass transition related to this plexiglass or polymethyl metacrylate around 100 20 degrees or so. However, you have quite different behavior. So this regular structure made by ATRP, these black uh, squares, you could see that they start flowing around 150 degrees. So it's a very regular structure. But if you look at a gradient, gradient stays phase separated up to 250 degrees. So really what you have, you have this asymmetry in these molecules. They in some sense phase separate. You have a, this PMMA plexiglass rich domains, 
surrounded by very soft PDMS. If you apply any kind of a stress to them, they essentially break, and that's why it has only 30% elongation. So let me show you now some examples of a little bit more densely grafted structures. So it would be not every 20 unit, but essentially every unit. And these are really molecular brushes, which can be prepared, like I showed you before, in three different processes. Grafting from, which I will show at the end, grafting through, and also grafting onto. So you can really prepare quite large variety of these molecular brushes, and I think the beauty of that is also that you can visualize them. They have dimensions of, let's say, several hundred nanometers, sometimes even a micron, but really what you could see sometimes is how they would uh, form this gradient, which I showed you before, how they can form a rod coil structure, how they can form something like a herring bone structure, if it would be crystallizable. You can have intercalated structures, you can make something like a, a starfish, you can make sometimes uh, networks from them as well. They have a very unique also optical properties, which I'll explain a little bit further, because they behave like photonic materials if they face separate on a size related to uh, uh, light wavelength, essentially. So one warning is, because sometimes people will say, okay, I made a molecular brush, but in reality, sometimes they make more like a star. Although you have the same macromonomer, but everything depends on the aspect ratio. If your backbone is very short, in fact, it will be nearly like a focal point, and then you will have these side chains forming a star-like structure. If you would grow them longer and longer, eventually they would form these cylindrical structures and form like a swollen coil uh, in principle. So you can make them as well as stars, not only this way, you can make stars sometimes, as I will show you later, via cross-linking and sometimes via making a core and starting from them as well. But let me show you two examples how to graft one of the simplest cases. You can commercially buy polyethylene oxide or polyethylene glycol, as sometimes it's called, with degree of polymerization 19 and 45, so this would correspond, roughly speaking, to molecular weight 1,000 and 2,000. And I will show you how you can copolymerize them to make first star-like structures and then brush-like structures. So it would be uh, targeting degree of polymerization 50 because this is also 50, so essentially a star, and also targeting degree of polymerization 500, so they would be elongated and forming essentially star-like molecules. So first, you know, we usually try to work under dilute conditions because you would not like to have a high viscosity because this can complicate the structures. And surprisingly, if you work at relatively high dilution, so this is five weight percent of this pegylated metacrylate, there is no polymerization. You need to go to higher and higher concentration only, like seven, 14, and higher concentration to get a polymer. In fact, this is related to a concept of equilibrium monomer concentration. Polymers and monomers are in equilibrium. And if you have a very high dilution, because in that case we have only five weight percent, but in fact it's a 50 millimolar concentration because this macromonomer has a very high molecular weight. And in that case, we cannot polymerize it below 50 millimolar. If you wish, sometimes you can make a polymer and then, if it is a living system, you can dilute it and it would depolymerize back to monomers. So what you need, you need to go to this, cross this threshold, which would be in that case, five weight percent. However, I showed you last time that we can play some tricks. So in that case, it would be example of the external stimuli essentially applying pressure. If we go to 3,000 atmospheres of three kilobars, this is what happened at one bar, this is what happens at the uh, 3,000 bars. You could see that this macromonomer signal practically disappears. It's 99% conversion, and we get high molecular weight brush-like structures. So can we essentially uh, do the same now with the uh, higher molecular weight, and can we go to also brush-like polymer? And in that case, you could see that if I target degree of polymerization 500, 
they form essentially the same like higher molecular weight and, and the higher pressure also works in a similar way. So this allows you really to polymerize this relatively short. This is a molecular weight 1000 polyethylene oxide. Now what happens if I would go to this higher molecular weight? So this is having side chain degree of polymerization, roughly speaking 50 or 2000 molecular weight micromolar. Exactly the same problem. First, 50 millimolar, you cannot go below this value. And of course, in that case, this 50 millimolar, it's a twice higher molecular weight, is 10 weight percent, right? If I go to higher pressure, higher pressure for these relatively short chains or stars, it works equally well. You could see that macromonomer practically disappears, 99% conversion. Now, can I go to the higher molecular weight? And this is something which is very unusual observation because we could, for these shorter chains, go to degree of polymerization 500 without any problem. Here, we cannot. In fact, it's a very unusual behavior because if we go to at the same concentration, if I target higher and higher degree of polymerization, I reach lower and lower conversion, which means I cannot cross a kind of a magic degree of polymerization. In that case, it's approximately 90. So we know sometimes about this monomer equilibrium concentration, but now you have the degree of polymerization at equilibrium. Essentially, you cannot cross from this star-like structure to brush-like structures. Whether you use higher pressure, lower pressure, it's a kind of a magic problem because here the star has a much lower steric effect instead of a brush, and brush essentially cannot be formed under these conditions. So, so to summarize briefly what I showed you before is that if I use a low degree of polymerization of the side chains, 1000 micromonomer, I can form a star and then I can form a brush and if I apply higher pressure, it works even better. If I use this 2000 molecular weight micromonomer, I can form the star, but I cannot go to a brush. If I apply higher pressure, unfortunately, it doesn't happen either. So how can we make these uh, beautiful brushes which I showed you before? Essentially, we cannot go by grafting through. We need to go by grafting from. So grafting from gives you one advantage, that you really have a very exothermic polymerization and you have many monomer units. For polymerization of acrylates, they have an enthalpy of a reaction in a range of 20 kilocalories per mole. So they really push so much the structure that they don't care about steric effects here because they want to polymerize this monomer. And because of that, sometimes they have a very large strain generated here. We cannot go this way, we, cannot go, we can go this way, but it will be at the expense of some kind of a properties as well. However, I wanted to show you that you can really make them quite efficiently. So these are brushes which has a, uh, here approximately degrees of polymerization 400 each arm. We make them by using tetrafunctional initiator, then make this backbone and eventually start grafting the side chains and you could see them here as the magnified structure. In fact, 50% of these side chains lie on the surface, 50% are desorbed because they cannot reach the surface. So this is especially nicely seen here if you make this very long brush and this is 200 nanometers bar, <coughs> degree of polymerization for thousand it means it is essentially one micron long chains. But if you have a every quarter nanometer, every second carbon atom grafts, the side chain diameter is approximately one nanometer. Distance between every graft is quarter nanometer. So if I put half of the chains on the left side, half on the right side of the backbone, there is no space for 50% of chains. So these 50% of chains lie on the surface and eventually they would like to go to a surface. And these generate big tensions. So we have a project with uh, Professor Shekel some time ago, and he wanted to make these brushes with a very long side chains to see them perfectly stretched. And after we made some of them, it's degree of polymerization backbone for 1,100 degree of polymerization of a side chain. He sent me this picture, he said, it's amazing. It's unbelievable. 
you could see this is five microns. So these are one micron long soft polymer chains which are completely stretched. But then next week he sent me this picture. He said, you send me garbage. You know, these are really, it's not a brush polymer. I don't know what is it. And then next week he sent me this one. No, 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 they are perfect. And then next week he said, no, it's a garbage. And everything different, it was exactly the same material, but imaged on a different support. So this was done on aqueous methanol and this was done on water. So apparently surface energy is so high and polybutylacrylate chains want to go on a surface so much that they stretched backbone to such a degree that carbon-carbon bond is cleaved. So essentially you shred these brushes by applying tension on a surface. So this depends, as I mentioned to you, on a surface energy. You can control the surface energy quite precisely. And if you go to high and higher surface energy, you essentially chop, or they chop themselves, these, these brushes. It depends on a time. In fact, the interactions of polybutylacrylate segment with water is approximately 2 kT. So if you have degree of polymerization 150, you essentially start cleaving this uh, bond because carbon-carbon bond would be in a range of the 150 kTs. So you could see here practically like a movie, these are snapshots from a movie, and you can observe with your eyes chemical reaction. It's a cleavage of a carbon-carbon bond. And you could see here what happens in time, five minutes, two hours, six, 16, and eventually they are chopped into star-like structures. These stars, they have no more tension, so they cannot break. So you could see here that the land drops from a micron sometimes or several hundred nanometers to a value around 100 nanometers when they occupy a surface like essentially star-like structures. And dispersity, in fact, first increases and then drops low value because they all are the same. So we name these interactions like a fatal uh, attraction or fatal absorption. It was a movie with Kirk Douglas, I think, some time ago, how fatal attraction may be uh, fatal under some conditions. And in fact, it's a one probably message to, to remember that if you construct very complicated structures, whether it would be a brush or sometimes dendrimer or some even hybrid materials, in solution, they may be happy. But once they land on the surface, tension becomes so large that this fragile structure starts breaking. So here we can cleave these chains maybe 100 times. But can I make something special and cleave a chain only once? How can I cleave it just in half? And in principle, what you need to do, you need to incorporate in the center a weaker bond. So we start in this case with the sulfur-sulfur containing initiator. So in that case, this is instead of the 80, it is 50 kilocalories per mole. And once we grow this brush, in solution it is still happy. But once it lands on a surface, you could see that I can cleave it in half very quickly. And then progressively, slow and slower, I start chopping additional backbone. So this is what happens with this uh, in time with a sulfur-sulfur bond and carbon-carbon bond and the same conditions goes much, much, much slower. So can I uh, also catalyze this reaction? And in fact, sulfur-sulfur bond can be uh, cleaved in the presence of some reducing agent, some things like, for example, dithiotritol. So if you, plat if you place this brush on a surface of water, and then you add a little bit of this DTT compound into it, you could see that depending on concentration of DTT, rate of a cleavage is very different. This is without DTT, and then you progressively add something like, in that case, 20 micromolar concentration, and progressively 40, 60, and so on, and you could see that this rate becomes <coughs> larger and larger and larger. So now, what is very interesting in this case is that you can plot the uh, rate of a cleavage, which you can measure by AFM, essentially, the rate of this chemical reaction, as a function of DTT concentration. And now you can guess what is a pH of a water surface, because all of that happens at the surface of water. I put this brush on the surface of water. And in fact, it's a very intriguing uh, conclusion, because 
Uh, in fact, in literature, you can find answers that water surface is acidic or water surface is basic. If you look at this dependence, how this rate depends on a pH, essentially this rate tells you that pH of the water surface is pretty acidic, is 3.7. So why some people say it's acidic, some basic? Probably because water molecules may orient in a different way. If you have this polyester, polybutyl acrylate on the surface via hydrogen bonding, you have essentially HO groups oriented in this way. If you have some maybe basic structure or acidic structure, it may be different. But under these conditions, it really answer is that pH is pretty acidic, is in a range of 3.7 or so. So how else we can incorporate uh, branches? Because we are talking about topologies and composition during this lecture. In principle, there are three ways how you would do that. One is that you can do that before polymerization starts, which means I can take multifunctional initiator, I can graft structures, I can also graft arms from a star, or I can do it also by combining together. So this is grafting onto process. And also very intriguing, as you will see later, is can you do that during polymerization? Can I add a divinyl compound, any kind of a crosslinker, and can I end up also having sometimes grafts, sometimes stars, sometimes networks? And I will be using essentially three components, sometimes macro initiators, macro monomers, like I showed you before, macro crosslinkers, and sometimes even you could use macro enumer, which means both enumer, initiator, and monomer in the same uh, molecule. And we'll be making essentially sometimes gels, sometimes stars. I will focus on these two systems. So, in fact, everything depends not only what is the ratio of reagents, but when they will start reacting. So, for example, if I have a little bit of a crosslinker, I can add crosslinker at the beginning, and I will form a kind of a core of a star, and then if I add a monomer later, I end up with a star. Extreme case would be very different. I grow polymer chains, and then I add this crosslinker at the very end. Because of steric effects, they cannot form a gel-like structure, they form exactly the same type of a star. If I add it at the beginning, then I can have a more or less typical network, and if I keep adding it later and later, I can have maybe something like a fuzzy star with a fuzzy core and side chain. So essentially it depends maybe not only when you add it, but when it is incorporated. Because it depends also what is the reactivity of a monomer and the reactivity of a crosslinker, acrylate versus metacrylate, like I showed you before. So this is one example. I can make this core first, then grow these side chains in star, and then I can add another monomer, and I have a block star polymer made this way. This totally opposite situation is such that I can use a macro initiator, or sometimes macro monomer, and then crosslink it. Advantage of this is that I can have a functional initiator, and this functional initiator will give me functional stars. However, under some conditions, not only clean stars can be formed, sometimes these stars may couple together, eventually it can make a gel. So if you have a too many active sites around here, then they can crosslink too efficiently. So classically, what we do, we have a one arm and one halogen atom after crosslinking. So this core of a star is very heavily functionalized, and therefore it can interact and sometimes make you star star coupling. So can I have a system in which I will have a not one-on-one -on -one arm versus halogen, but can I have a maybe 10 arms and one halogen only? How it can be done? Not with macro initiator, but I can do macro monomer. So in that case, I can have a macro monomer and then a little bit of a low molar mass initiator I can have them at different ratios. So, for example, 10 to 1, I will have a 10 times more arms than these bromine atoms for potential crosslinking. And this system works relatively nice. And you could see here what happens. I add essentially this macro monomer and a little bit of an uh, initiator and a little bit of a crosslinker. And then I keep titrating this system. A little bit of a crosslinker, divinyl benzene, initiator, crosslinker, divinyl benzene. 
This is macromonomer, concentration drops and drops and drops, star concentration increases, and I get eventually half a million molecular weight star with 72 arms and very low dispersity, 1.2, and the efficiency of star formation, 98%, which is pretty good, in fact, probably related to functionality of macromonomer itself. So can I still improve this system somehow? So this is one example of using pre-organized structure. In that case, I start making die block, functional macromonomer or macroinitiator, and then if it is amphiphilic structure, it can organize itself, and then I can add a crosslinker, and this crosslinker will form under these heterogeneous conditions much higher yield of a star. And indeed, if you use exactly the same polyethylene oxide, polystyrene, bromine, this is under homogeneous conditions, DMF, everything is homogeneous. And this is done in heterogeneous systems in water. In the former case, I get a star with molecular weight 200,000, and this one 1.5 million. This has dispersity 1.2, this is 1.07. And number of arms 20 here, 116. So this is really pretty good improvement under these conditions. So what else you could do with these stars? In principle, you can have a star which would have a dual reactivity. One would be used for crosslinking, another for post-reaction. So for example, I use this amphiphilic structure. This will have a, a good initiator, as you remember from a previous lecture, this bromophenyl acetate containing azide. And then this is hydrophilic, this is hydrophobic. I then crosslink it, and I can crosslink under several different conditions. So one condition is such that I will really feel the star core, like I showed before. But another one that I can dilute it, for example, by a solvent. And in that case, I can only crosslink the core. And here I can package, put something inside, like a cargo. Then I can depending on a crosslinker, crosslinker can be cleavable, for example, disulfide under conditions which would be reducing diacetyl under acetic conditions, so I can cleave them and deliver this cargo. Or potentially, you can attach here another functionality because this azido group can be uh, combined by click reaction with something else, or you can go even polymer chains. So this is one example, how it happened, and in that case, we have these azides, several of them uh, incorporating this Dansil probe, which contains the alkyne, and in that case, you have this probe, which you can really calculate how many arms you have, how many functionalities, and so on. So let me uh, switch to the part which would be related to, to gels. So gels are generally probably most difficult to characterize because uh, we cannot use, uh, for example, gel permeation chromatography or something else, but how really these gels are formed if we add them at a certain concentration, at a certain amount of crosslinker, at a certain amount of the um, uh, solvent, and so on. So really, what happens is if you take a, a monomer, crosslinker, and initiator, you progressively start incorporating these crosslinkers. But in reality, a gel point is not depending on the amount of crosslinker versus monomer, but amount of crosslinker versus initiator, which means how many crosslinks you have per chain. If you have a controlled polymerization, like you have seen before, all chains start growing at the same time, and then these crosslinkers are progressively incorporated, at a certain moment, you get more and more branch structure, and at a certain moment, gel. Gel point is relatively easy to be measured sometimes by rheology. You can, the simplest case is you have a test tube. When you flip it upside down, when you see it doesn't flow, practically, you get a gel point. Or if you have a steering bar, if the bubbles stop coming from the bottom, it means you get a gel point. So it is really these, these uh, bubbles are trapped. It's very interesting to see also what happens by gel permeation chromatography. Of course, you cannot inject a gel into your GPC system because it will damage a, a column. So you need to filter it. And then if you have this uh, solid, essentially, you will see what happens. That molecular weight would increase, increase, and the gel points stop decreasing, which means that the highest fraction goes to a gel 
and you cannot analyze them. So this is really goes up and down, and then at this moment it was a gel point, it goes back and back. However, you always see this macro or individual chains, which means that even if you have a gel point, it doesn't mean everything is a gel. You may have a 50% of a gel, 50% of a salt under these conditions. So to show you some examples here, you could see what happens if you change the ratio of a crosslinker to initiator. Monomer acts as a diluent. So really what is important is how many crosslinkers you have per initiator or per chain, if you wish. So if this value is equal 0.9, you could see that practically there is no gel. You get to the end, you have still crosslinker, you have a branch structures, no gel. If you cross this ratio one, in that case, you see that after nine hours, there is a gel point, and fraction of the gel, 43%, and your gel can swell 3,000 times, or 36 times, right? So it's a really very loose gel. If I put more crosslinker, this gel time is reduced, and also gel fraction progressively increased. So if I use 10 crosslinker per initiator, a gel fraction is 98%, it's pretty tight gel, because the swelling ratio here is 36 times, this is only three times. So it's a gel which cannot swell much under these conditions. So we can make these gels in different ways. And I showed you to some of you uh, at the first lecture how these systems can behave, but you can really make a gel by making sometimes uh, this brush-like uh, construct and then combine them together. Sometimes you can have a network and then you can start grafting from this network and eventually you can crosslink something like a di-functional with monofunctional materials. And they behave depending on the degree of crosslinking or distance between essentially these parts. Uh, may have a different swelling ratio, different mechanical properties. This is one example of such a very soft material which absorbs shock, absorbs energy, and you can drop uh, essentially any kind of the object which is fragile like uh, egg without uh, breaking it. And sometimes you can even uh, go to the uh, larger distance and do uh, the same from the second or even uh, third floor with a more or less similar success. So I wanted to show you uh, really what can be done with, with networks. So one example of this uh, network is shown here that we construct by using tetrafunctional initiators. We crosslink them first in a form of pretty regular network and eventually we have some functionalities here and we start grafting side chains. So they are becoming very soft. You could see that this plateau modulus is in a range of a few kilopascal. So they are super soft like materials which I showed you before. But generally a concept of having this functionalized network can be expanded in a, in a broader sense. So I wanted to show you these examples of materials which we call uh, stem gels. So for abbreviation, stem gels means structurally tailored engineered macromolecular gels, but in principle, it has a big analogy with stem cells. So stem cells can differentiate into muscles, into hair, into bones, into nerves, and stem gels can become sometimes hydrophilic, hydrophobic, hard, soft, uh, inorganic containing or biomolecule containing and so on. So this is really how you can engineer these gels. And of course, there are several parameters. You may change a mesh size, and this would be really by controlling a ratio of monomer to crosslinker. You may have a different functionality or initiator size, sometimes one, sometimes several of them. You may have a longer side chains or shorter or longer. You may convert them into block copolymers. Eventually, they can even face separate as well. You can uh, modify them with different molecules, can be some organic molecule, can be inorganic, can be biomolecule, can be polymer structure as well. And I think quite interesting is also possibility of controlling them in space, like we discussed last time, by some external stimuli. Light would be probably the easiest using especially uh, two photon uh, uh, systems. 
So in that case, we can address these initiate insights and grow them in a particular uh, order, sometimes all of them, sometimes one. So it can be potentially used as a uh, scaffold for 3D printing as well. Uh, they can be sometimes prearranged, making them from micto arms and uh, using also as a scaffold potentially molecular brushes which can get connected together. So I will show you uh, some examples how this can be done using as example, in fact, this three-dimensionally ordered macropore structure. So we make a construct using uh, photonic-like crystals assembly, and then we can uh, prepare them, remove these templates, and eventually prepare them as a functional structure. So the concept is shown more or less here. One starts from the colloidal particles. This is polystyrene or polymethyl metacrylate, 200 to 500 nanometers beads. They are prepared by emulsion-free systems, very regular, by the dispersion polymerization, and then you can assemble them together. Once they are assembled together, they are hydrophobic, polystyrene, let's say, beads. Then you can infiltrate them with a monomer, which has a functionality hydroxy group, and also crosslinker. And then, once you infiltrate, they are not miscible, not swellable, under uh, aqueous conditions, then you can crosslink them. You can crosslink them, uh, or polymerize, essentially, them, using either free radical or atom transfer radical process. And then once you have a network, you can remove these beads because this is a soluble polystyrene or polymethyl metacrylate. You wash it in THF or acetone. And essentially what you get, you get the replica of these beads which were removed. And our first experiments, in fact, they were quite uh, surprising because we tried to purify them using the atom transfer radical process, these gels. They were always very green. Once we dried them, color disappeared. So then we skipped using any copper, because it could be green color coming from copper, exactly the same color. So this really, what you see, is a classical Bragg diffraction process, because you have a very periodic structures with a wavelength uh, light uh, in this range. So whether uh, you have it, in that case, you have this regular structure, they give you this color. If you drive them, color disappears, then reappears, and you can do it many times back and forth again. Now, once you have this network, you can potentially infiltrate them, for example, with a crosslinker divinyl benzene. And then you can remove this uh, secondary gel. You have exactly the same structure as assembled before. So you have this replica, essentially, of a material. <coughs> so the key, really, for this system is that we would like to really have a very good communication, meaning that you have really these uh, beads touching one another. So they cover original structure 75 volume percent, 25 percent of gels. If this is 200 nanometer size, in that case, you have 11, 12 windows connecting one another and they are approximately 20 nanometers each. If you go to 500, it would be essentially uh, 50 nanometers. So you can look by the uh, three-dimensional uh, computer tomography. You can essentially fly through this sample, and you could see that they are really interconnected, which would be very good for any kind of a catalysis or biocatalysis, some other processes. And eventually, you go from one to the other end, by flying through these interconnected structures. So this is important because we would like to use these stem gels for various applications, including uh, uh, conductive materials and uh, bioactive materials as well. So if you have this structure which contains hydroxy groups at the end, so this is quite hydrophilic system, now we can uh, esterify them with uh, fatty acids and before the reaction, you could see that the hydrophilic structure is very strong because the water droplet essentially spreads completely contact angle close to zero degrees. If you change them with these uh, <coughs> fatty acids, now it becomes very hydrophobic. You can do something similar with polymers, which would be temperature responsive, having lower critical solution temperature. So this is classical polyanisopropyl acrylamide, 
which has LCS around 30 degrees. If you add 25 degrees, it is very hydrophilic. At 45 degrees, it becomes hydrophobic, and you can change progressively this structure. You can use these uh, functionalities for some other purpose. So this is making conductive polymers. This is polymerization of aniline in the presence of these uh, carboxylic groups. And uh, after oxidation, they form uh, conductive polyaniline. And you could see here, when you have no contact and you have contact, they are really macroscopically conductive. Or you can modify these systems also using dyes. In that case, this uh, rhodamine dye. And uh, without rhodamine, uh, whether uh, UV light or white light, practically no absorption. And here, very strong fluorescence and absorption as well. I will show you uh, tomorrow some examples of the uh, hybrid materials. But this is uh, one uh, case. How you can use these stem gels and uh, functionalize them, in that case, with small uh, gold clusters. And these gold clusters, are after reduction uh, of uh, gold uh, trichloride, they are forming gold nanoparticles. And these gold nanoparticles of a size of uh, 5, 10 nanometers, they can be used, for example, for reduction of a nitrophenol to, to aminophenol. Or you can also use magnetic nanoparticles. And these magnetic nanoparticles are attached. And now you have a gel which can respond to the magnetic field and uh, entire gel can be attracted by magnet to one or the other side. And the final example which I wanted to show you today is really modification with a biomolecule. So uh, this is by attaching a trypsin uh, enzyme uh, to these uh, nanogels. And then you can see how uh, this bovine serum albumin is partially degraded. And you can use also model compounds in that case is, uh, uh, benzoyl, arginine, ethyl ester, hydrochloride, and you could see that uh, its concentration dramatically drops practically to zero. You can pack them in a HPLC columns and essentially, because of this interconnectivity, use them for catalysis, use them for some other uh, examples. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, really summarize more or less what I told you that essentially you can, by designing the topology, composition, and functionality, you cre can create materials which would sometimes have a continuous change of composition, like gradients, making block of polymers, making molecular brushes, highly branched structure, making stars, making functional molecules, and some even more uh, sophisticated structures which would be related to the uh, bioconjugates and also hybrid materials, which I will uh, discuss uh, with you next week on, on Thursday. So I wanted to uh, thank some people who participate in this work. This is at the top of the Mellon Institute, which I showed at the first lecture. And this is St. Paul Cathedral. And people who uh, did this work include uh, Paweł Krysz, uh, Asia Burdyńska, Kasia Wagner, and uh, Dominik uh, Konkolewicz. And we collaborated with Tomek Kowalewski and also with Sergei Sheiko on this project. So I think with that, I would like to thank you and answer any questions if you have. Thank you.